so you have an idea for a fictional world. Well, now what? Fiction writing. It sounds easy enough. And my job is to tell it like it is, or was, or whatever. I'm a writer, I give the truth scope! Hardly easy. Worlds are created. Layer by layer. So how dare I, I mean, how dare I have outrageous expectations about these sorts of things? You know, like, no whitewashing, and not using a single gimmick in place of an actual ethnic identity. The point is that short form narratives, such as movies, rarely, and I mean very rarely, succeed at developing cultures or feeling like a real environment while some, at least, make an attempt at it and don't quite get there. And yet, even Shakespeare's plays are, at best, a snapshot of the era and not a masterclass on the society as a whole, much like some of the best short stories. And I realize that in many cases that wasn't their intended purpose, but I just can't help but feel like it convinces long-form fiction writers that they can get away with similar shortcuts. However... Some creators have proven capable of capturing the complexity of culture without weighing down their narratives. Surprisingly, my best examples are all webcomics, and here's my theory on why. Some elements of ethnic identity are best conveyed through language, and speech bubbles or text boxes can enhance the impact. On the other hand, some folklore is better shown than told, especially with the limited knowledge base many readers suffer from. The marathon method is better than exposition dump sprints for getting readers invested. Webcomics are often one to three person teams, keeping them and their passion closer to the end product. The support network needed to persevere through such an arduous task is critical for writers without upfront financing. More importantly, culture is interactive, and sometimes the best way to develop your world is outside sources asking questions about it. I mean, what other medium can match that? games for the story threads. Crazy people. But for the sake of good advice material, this series can help anyone write text-only or visual-only narratives. There's literally dozens of webcomics out there for me to compare. I only have two ground rules. Number one. I'm going to do my best not to focus on the art style so much as if the cultural messages were conveyed successfully. And number two, it would be unfair to review webcomics on this level without roughly three chapters finished first. Get it? Got it? Good. But why should you care? Well, I'm trying to take the Bill Nye approach, but let me give you an incentive anyway. In comparing Disney animation during his time to other studios, such as Tex Avery's, the word that came up was always realistic, but that wasn't the word Disney himself used. He encouraged his animators to convey the plausible impossible. Hey, does the boss know that all this is going on? Oh, sure. This is no picnic. It's all part of their work. Work? Yes, you see, before they can cartoon an animal, they have to have some idea of what the real thing looks like. That's not bad, Ken. But try to get more comedy into it, more cartoon feeling. Don't be afraid to exaggerate. See? He told them to study how real beings move and act, but then tangent off from there. He knew their animation could be impossible by the laws of Earth physics while still being plausible. Now that doesn't make Tex Avery's animation bad, but he outright intended for the style to not be realistic. And if you're in the same boat as Tex Avery, then you're having one of the three reactions that I expected. Firstly, aha, but mine is a magical world where anything is possible and I can do whatever I want. Well, yes, but you're thinking of suspension of disbelief, in which you ask the reader to buy into impossible elements of your story. My statement about the plausible impossible means that, given these impossible elements exist in your world, the rest of your story follows its own consistent internal logic system, whether that system is batshit insane, difficult to understand, or not. I'll say things like, eagles do not live underground, 
knowing about that caveat. I know that magic can do anything. Heck, technology and steampunk can manage that too. But if you use this, it's magic, so screw that argument enough times compounded across your entire world building process, what you are going to end up with is Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. And that is a-okay if that's what you want. Go forth and I wish you the best, but this series will not help you. The second group of people would respond with, but of course eagles don't live underground. And I'm going to do as much research on their habitats as I possibly can before I write a single word. Kudos to you. In truth, we're a lot alike. You folks will probably be most happy creating a book list from my work cited notes and the book reviews that I do and my tips videos, then running off and burying yourself in the library for a very long time. You are looking to create Middle Earth. And again, that is a-okay if that's what you're going for. It takes quite literally years, and I hope to help you navigate some of the terms that you didn't know beforehand. Why such a mundane topic has such an esoteric discipline is a rant for another time. Anyway, I'm here to provide, in small bites, the same kind of information that most people gloss over when they see it as walls of text on social media posts, not replace the subject-specific information that you, group two, will probably want to research. Good luck to you, and I can't wait to see what you create. So that leaves us with the third group, the middle ground. The people who see the merit in making their world at least semi-realistic, but aren't so bogged down with details like the temperature range of each geographic region on their map. This group says, I accept that there is somewhere between Wonderland and Middle Earth. These are the people that I'm trying to help the most. The people in the middle who can go either way depending on how easy this stuff is to understand. Hence dedicating my first five episodes to covering how anthropologists look at real world cultures. We call it the five pillars of society. They are ecology or economy, depending on your preferred definition. It's how resources are acquired. Enculturation is how the people learn and grow. Governance is how conflicts are resolved. Supernaturalism is how the unknown is perceived. And the fifth pillar really should be tools, but in lay terms it's easier to say technology because it's how we customize our world. Basically, it's about change over time. In order to showcase how each pillar can help world builders, I'm going to look at five of my favorite web comics on a deep analytical level. The first four creators have graciously given their permission to be included in this kickoff to my web series, but I hope Mr. Sedell will give me the thumbs up in time for Gunner Creek Court to be included too. Up first for deep analysis is the Eco Pillar, courtesy of Unsounded by Ashley Cope. 